Hunter, last week we talked a lot about coffee, sort of one of the most popular beverages in the world in terms of, I don't know, just people drinking in the morning. Today, however, we're going to talk a little bit more about another beverage, tea. And so I'm going to throw this right at you right off the bat. What are you a tea drinker? Do you drink? I am. I am an occasional tea drinker, so I don't drink tea every day. uh, But I will sometimes drink tea in the afternoon, and I always drink pretty much one kind of tea. It's um, Twining's decaffeinated Earl Grey. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I I'm a huge Earl Grey drinker myself. Actually, I have multiple cups in the morning every single day. I actually kind of expected you just knowing from our previous episode that you're mostly a coffee drinker. I was Mm -hmm. kind of expecting you to come back and tell me that you drink mostly herbal tea, especially when you said in the afternoon, because I think most people who might not consider themselves a tea drinker, they do typically enjoy some, some various form of herbal tea, Uh, whether that's, you know, a lemon or a chamomile or, you know, Mm -hmm. what there's a million different kinds of teas out there. I mean, I've certainly had those teas, but don't drink them that often. I, I do like the sort of hardiness of, of the, of the black tea. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's, there's a, there's a level of comfort inside, you know, drinking a, a nice Earl Grey, for example, just like, it just, it really like sets my mood at ease <laughs> a little bit. Uh, do you but I think what uh, we're drink gonna find, it straight up or do you, do you put stuff in it? I put a, yeah. So sure. I'll, I'll walk, I'll walk people through, through my morning routine here really quick. Uh, Cause I think it's kind of interesting what I do. Uh, not in terms of like what I add into my tea, but so I, I'll wake up and I'll, I'll start my day off with a Earl Grey tea. I have a little electric water kettle. If you don't have one, get one. They're amazing. They boil water so fast. Uh, so I start my tea with an Earl Grey. And in particular, I, I'm a huge fan of Stash, Stash Tea, which happens to be a local brand. Although that's not why I like them, though. Maybe it does actually impact my decision a little bit. <laughs> Regardless, uh, I and not, not only do I like Earl Grey, but I like Stash's double bergamot Earl Grey. And so that bergamot flavor okay. is really, really heavy in this one, which I love. There's just something about it that, again, very comforting. So I'll have one cup of of double bergamot Earl Grey, followed by a cup of chai. So again, another black tea. Mm. And then followed by another cup, cup of double bergamot Earl Grey. And then as the day goes on, I will switch to peppermint or lemon herbal teas. And so I'm basically drinking tea so you drink- from dawn till dusk. All day long. Wow. Basically, and you put yeah. any milk or sugar in that? I do. I add a little bit of uh, oat milk into into my black teas, not my okay. herbal teas. Yeah. Right. It's great. It's it's to me, it's a beverage that can be drunk, you know, at all times of day because there are various kinds of tea, which we're going to get to in a little bit that come with various mm-hmm. levels of caffeine, which we're going to talk a little bit about as well. We're going to compare that a little bit with our coffee episode from last week. And I just think overall, it's a it's just a beverage that is more amenable to. There's less that needs to be done to, I guess, decaffeinate it. Of course, it can be decaffeinated, like you had mentioned. But if you're not a caffeine drinker, there's still plenty of teas out there for you. And so, we're going to talk a little bit about all of this today, as well as the history. If you haven't haven't picked up on what this episode is yet, listener, it is geography is tea, which is a global beverage. This is the kind of quasi part two of our kind of quasi two part episode. Of, you know, the first one being on coffee, this one being on tea. The reason why it's quasi and kind of is because really these two beverages are linked in so many different weird ways that they kind of made sense for us to do them back to back. That said, they're not, these are totally independent episodes. So you could listen to one or the other. It doesn't really matter. Hopefully you're listening to both because that's what we like. <laughs> we want you to listen to both. Um, we want you to listen to both. We do. We really do. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into just a little bit of terminology. Uh, uh, and I'm going to throw another question out here at you here in a minute, um, Hunter. But let's start with just, you know, what is tea, right? So tea is really air, any aromatic beverage that's prepared by pouring hot or boiling water over cured or fresh leaves. And so if we go back to our coffee episode, there was really two kinds of beans. Uh, Hunter, what were those again? Arabica and Robusta. Arabica and Robusta beans that 
uh, really a lot of our coffee is derived from. However, for tea, it's a little bit of a different story. It's really almost anything can be a tea so long as it's, you can pour hot water on it and it sort of brews itself. And so with so that- So tea's not really a particular, it's not really a particular plant. It's the preparation that makes it tea, it seems like. It, it, exactly. It's, it's, it's almost entirely the preparation. It's entirely the, the, geez, I, I, yeah, I guess it's just the preparation. Um, you know, obviously there are things that, you know, if, if, if you pour hot water onto it and something dissolves, for example, that's not tea. So tea does have leaves that aren't going to dissolve. There's no, you know, there was instant coffee from our last episode. There's no instant tea, at least in sort of the same way that we might think of it as instant coffee. You still have your tea bags mm -hmm. or your tea leaves floating around. And so with that, Hunter, I'm going to throw you a question. Maybe you already know the answer to this because I know you, you have my notes in front of you. But do you know what the difference between tea and chai is? I, my guess would have been before I looked at your notes is that it's a particular <laughs> variety of, of tea. Like it's a particular plant or something like that, uh, that is distinct from other ones. Um, that's, that would have been my guess. Right. And I think most people probably assume that that's the case, right? They, they see something that's called, um, uh, chai tea, for example, really, all, all chai is, I mean, if we really base it down to like the terminology, uh, chai is really just a, a another word for tea, which is derived from the Chinese word cha. And I, I could be mispronouncing that. It may, may, might still be pronounced chai, uh, but C-H-A is how it, it's sort of spelled in the English uh, language. Uh, but really, it is thought of as being a specific type of tea, which is in general, if you're ordering a chai, you know, whatever tea at, you know, whatever coffee place or tea place, it is uh, something that would be called masala chai, which is that very distinct flavor and aroma that is often gets associated with uh, chai. And so if you go to buy a store, chai tea, whatever, it's probably this. But also, if you call something chai tea, as I just did, as I've done multiple times now, really all you're basically saying is tea tea. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of a fun vernacular there. Um the last word that we're going to run through, and just because we're going to talk a little bit about this a little bit later, is an infuser. Um, so typically, a lot of uh, things you start seeing around, you know, specialty teas, you know, you start hearing this word infuser. And this is really just a device in which loose uh, uh, tea leaves are placed for steeping or brewing. So this can be inside a mug, it can be in a teapot full of hot water, uh, it can come inside like a little metal ball with little uh, uh, pinprick holes in it so that water can come in and out and escape. Uh Sometimes yep. it's called a tea egg. A tea bag would also be a type of infuser. And that's sort of where we're going to connect a little bit later is the tea bag, because there's an interesting story there. And so with that, let's get into some of the types of tea that we're talking about today. And so we've already talked about Earl Grey and chai. Um, these would be black teas, right? So black teas are probably, at least in this side of the world, it's probably what people are thinking about when they think about tea. So your English breakfast, uh, your Earl Grey, your Assam, your Darjeeling tea, these would all be black teas. And if you remember, if you did listen to the coffee episode, uh, if you haven't, feel free to go back and listen to it. But we we did some we did some comparisons there. And if you listen to it, you'll recall that the average amount of black tea or caffeine in black tea was about forty six milligrams per eight ounce cup of uh, cup of black tea, compared to I think it was somewhere around ninety eight. Uh, 96 for coffee. Is that right? That's correct. That's right. So black tea on average, not as much caffeine as coffee, um, but then green tea has a bit less than black tea, but still has caffeine. Right. Exactly. So we'll, we'll just keep going through here. Uh, so then there's, there's green tea, right? So black tea generally, probably what we associate, you know, here in the United States, as well as a uh, place like Canada and the UK. Um, because that's so much part of the culture here is certainly with the with the caffeine involved. But there's also green tea, which is uh, also fairly popular. It's lighter in flavor, also lighter in caffeine. Uh, some some popular brands would be or types of green green tea would be uh, Chunmi, uh, Ti Kuan Yin, and Gunpowder. 
And I did do a little bit of research into the gunpowder variety of green tea and why it was called gunpowder. And it's not because of the strength of the tea. It's because of the way it was sort of prepared into these little pellets that kind of looked like um, how uh, uh, gunpowder bullets would be, would have been made back in, I'm going to guess probably in the 16th, 17th, 1700s. Interesting. And, and so, I know, right? Very interesting. Uh, I, I thought for sure it was going to be like a super caffeine-packed green tea, but it's not. <laughs> it's it's relatively, relatively normal as far as I could find. Uh, from there, you have your white teas. Uh, white teas are not uncommon in the United States. You can find some brands floating around here, here and there. Uh, and these are typically, these are white teas that traditionally come from China's Fujian province. And I guess I should make this note here. Maybe I should have made it before. Uh, I might mispronounce uh, various things in this episode. There's a lot of words that I uh, that come with a, sort of a Chinese um, or Mandarin dialect that I'm not super familiar with. So if I do uh, get those wrong, I do apologize. But white teas come from China's Fujian province and are made of leaf buds and leaves of the camellia tree. So rather than... Um, uh, sort of uh, whatever the black teas are currently made of today. These come from a very specific tree. Um, and this tree has its roots set in the history that we're going to get to in a minute here. Um, and then we have a, another type of tea is called dark tea. And these are teas from Yunnan province uh, that are aged for up to 50 years in humidity and temperature controlled conditions to produce teas that have a typically earthy, uh, uh, mature, smooth flavor and aroma. And so those will be sort of the, mm. the top sort of types of teas that um, we might see at specialty stores, certainly for the white and dark teas. There's a few others we're not going to get into quite as bit. There's yellow teas, there's oolong teas, and then of course there's herbal teas. And herbal teas sort of make up the pantheon of, of any sort of variety of flavor of tea that you can think of, right? So you go to a store and you see peppermint tea, right? You see spearmint tea, you see lemon tea, you see all these different types of teas that don't have any caffeine in them typically. Chamomile, I guess, would also be a really good one to to lump in here. Uh, they don't have any sort of caffeine attached to them. They're usually just a uh, specific sort of flavor. Um, and that sort of really makes them amenable for drinking after dinner, for example, when people don't necessarily want the energy boost. And so with and that... You know, so these are, are all teas that are... These teas are generally served hot, right? Hot, hot or warm. These are all generally served hot, right? So... There is a whole sort of classification of tea called iced tea. Um, we're not going to get to iced tea too much in this episode. It just didn't, it, it's more of a cultural thing. You know, there's definitely, you yep. know, here in the U.S., um, you know, iced tea factors in a lot more heavily as more of a sugary beverage. Um, that sort of went hand, goes mm -hmm. hand in hand with more of the rise in soda and sort of the juice um, craze of the, the mid-1900s. There's also a huge cultural uh, part of uh, iced tea in the south, southern part of the U.S. called sweet tea, I think, um, mm -hmm. which is a very sugary beverage. Um, those, these, all these teas originally start out as something that is boiled, but then they get cooled, and so that that would be the main difference. There's also another sort of type of tea called sun tea. Um, again, we're not going to get into sun teas too much, but sun tea is a type of tea that is not boiled at all. Um, it's just, but it's brewed it gets warm out through in the sun. It's brewed out in the sun. Exactly. So through just the natural sort of the warming process of sun sort of sits there for hours and sort of brews itself. Um, there's again, also, sort there's of also Long basic. Island iced tea, but Long Island iced tea is something completely <laughs> different. Yes. There's also the Long Island iced tea, which is not tea at all. Uh, it just kind of tastes That's like a different tea and, and it will get you, um, it, it'll, it'll get you a buzz. All right. Um, I think, you know, as we went through all these different teas, you probably, listener, you probably picked up on one thing in particular, and that is a connection to China. And I think, you know, as we talk about China, and they're going to feature very prominently in this episode, I think the, the thing to take away from here is that China, specifically, most regions in China have their own style and brand of tea that has been passed down through generation to generation. And so this, I would say this is not entirely dissimilar from the way we would think about wine in France or beer in Germany. You know, if we go back to our beer episode, you know, beer breweries sort of spring up in a certain region, become very culturally dominant. The recipes are guarded. That's that's sort of what we're talking about with tea in China. So with that, let's go ahead and do some history. Okay. So 
This, you know, if we go again, if we go back to our coffee episode, you might remember and you listen to it, you might remember that the history of coffee is sort of mythologized a little bit. Um, the actual origins of it kind of uh, a little bit unknown. We're going to find that there's right. very similar sort of, yeah, very similar story here in China uh, or with tea in China. So the story um, uh, is completely you know, we, we have no idea if, it, if it's true or not, but it's kind of a fun story. So we'll list, we'll, we'll, I'll tell you to you right now. Um, so in 2737 BCE, so this was many thousands of years ago. So it's much, much before the story of, about coffee. Uh, but as the story goes, the Chinese emperor Shen Nung was sitting beneath a tree while his servant boiled drinking water, which to me was like kind of interesting because I don't necessarily assume drinking just boiled water as being... Um, as being something you would want to drink, something that's really hot like that, but maybe. But while while the servant was uh, uh, serving up this boiled drinking water, some leaves uh, fell from the tree and blew into the water. Uh, Shenong, a renowned herbalist, apparently, or you know, according to legend, decided to try the infusion that his servant had accidentally created. The tree was the camellia tree, and the resulting drink is what we now call tea. Now, of course. You know, it's impossible for us to know whether any of this is true. There's just, there's no records here. Um, it feels a little serendipitous to me. Uh, feels a little unlikely that, you know, it just happens to be this emperor who happens to be an herbalist and there happens to be a tree that drops in some leaves and he decided to drink it. Weirder things have happened, but generally it feels like, you know, maybe there's a little bit of extra spice thrown in there. I guess things like this are sometimes maybe have some truth to them and then some embellishment. So it's hard to be able to, to know which part it's, is yeah, the, exactly. the kernel that actually happened and which part was added on after. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it, again, again, it's, you know, I would say the the thing that I picked up was that, you know, even the very existence of this emperor is shrouded in legends and mythologies. So apparently he was the first Chinese emperor who then became a deity who taught the Chinese people, many of the things that they know today such as the use of the plow. So again, like the very existence of this emperor, you know, is I think it's at least a little bit debated about whether this was a actual person or whether it was a sort of uh, uh, deity that was created at some point. That said, tea drinking certainly became established in China long, long, long before it had ever been heard in the West. So we're talking hundreds of years, thousands of years, before the West had even had an idea of what tea was. Again, this is, you know, thousands of years before uh, coffee was first sort of realized in, in Ethiopia. Uh, we can trace some containers of, of tea um, back to the Han Dynasty. So they were found in tombs back in the Han Dynasty, which would be from around 206 BCE to about 220 CE. So this is sort of spanning that um, the, the, the ancient era into the more modernish era um under the tang dynasty which would be from around 618 to 906 ce tea is that's when tea firmly became established as the national drink of china and so again if tea has sort of got its start in 2700 bce you know it took almost 3000 years for that to finally actually become solidified as a drink of choice as the national drink of choice for china as a whole within the Tang Dynasty. Uh, it became such a favorite during this time that the during the 8th century, a writer called Lu Yu wrote the first book entirely about tea uh, called the Cha Ching. And again, I could be mispronouncing this, um, but I think it's more commonly known today as Tea Classic. And I think that's, that's a book you can still generally find around today, um, obviously translated into various other languages. And it was shortly after this that China was first introduced to Japan by Japanese Buddhist monks who had traveled to China to study. And so this is really, you know, now we're almost, you know, at the year 1000. This is kind of the first time in maybe potentially thousands of years that tea is actually going to expand beyond the uh, the borders of what would, you know, be sort of ancient China, one of the various dynasties' borders. And of course, tea is a pretty big part of uh, Japanese culture today, of course, as well. Absolutely. Yes. So, so tea today, uh, very prominently, um, uh, featured within Japanese culture, um, as we're going to find out, you know, as it sort of spreads around tea sort of embeds itself within various cultures. And so, 
you know, let's move ahead a little bit. So during the Song Dynasty, so again, this is um, a few hundred years later during, um, I have here in my notes, 1127 to 1279 CE. This is when uh, tea starts to travel uh, uh, westward. And so Arab merchants acquired tea from the city of Guangzhou in Fujian province so and carried it to the Middle East and other lands uh, where Muslims started drinking it in place of wine and other forbidden stimulants, stimulants and beverages. And again, you know, I'm just going to keep looping our coffee episode in here. Um, but if you recall during the coffee episode, there was a similar sort of story for why coffee started to be drunk uh, sort of in, in mass in, in sort of the Arabian Peninsula. And we sort of see a similar story uh, or history with, with tea, right? So, you know, alcoholic mm-hmm. beverages, you know, often looked down upon, often looked at as something that's not allowed. Um, and so tea becomes sort of a nice replacement. Again, I think it gives a little bit of that caffeine buzz, maybe not quite as much as coffee. Um, and therefore, may, maybe it's aside from that, it's it's a little bit more culturally acceptable. Mm-hmm. But here's where it starts getting a little, little weird, a little more serendipitous with our coffee episode, because if you recall, coffee uh, sort of has its ex- expansion starting in the early 1600s with some Dutch um, merchants. And we find out that tea has a very similar history. So by 1600, the Dutch had established a trading post on the island of Java, which is associated with coffee, but this is where they established their their uh, their trading post. And it was via Java that in 1606, the first consignment, so just a small little box of tea, was shipped from China to Holland or the Netherlands. Um, and it was uh, just a few short years later, a decade later, in 2010, a Dutch ship calling at Macau took the first full load of Chinese tea to Europe, where it was initially prized for its, for its medicinal value, um, but it had would quickly sort of manifest itself into a drink of choice. So by the early 1700s, so 16, Europeans 1610, become, right? 1610. 1610 is when sort of the first full yep. load of tea was shipped to Europe, yeah, rather than just sort of a, okay. a curio sort of kind of box. Mm-hmm. Um, so by the middle of the 1700s, the, uh, or sorry, sorry, by the early, early 1700s, Europeans had come to associate tea as a symbol of wealth and sophistication. So it's sort of perhaps in sort of the class and sort of wealthy elite sort of structure that a lot of, you know, societies had back then, but certainly Europe did. And this is something that was also happening in China, right? It becomes a, a, drink that's associated with a certain type of of people. And so by the middle of the 1700s, the association of tea uh, to wealth drew British merchants to taverns and coffee houses. And these coffee houses were originally modeled after uh, uh, Ottoman coffee houses. And tea quickly replaced the more expensive and harder to obtain coffee that gave these establishments their name. And so I'm not sure what the economics were at the time, um, but at one point the switch sort of happened where the UK started to drink more tea, according to my notes, due to the economics. But there was still like, just like with coffee, there was still an association with, um, with sort of wealth and status. Um, We just blazed through a lot of history. There's another big part of the history that we got to talk about within the United States. But before we do that, we got to do some ads. (laughs) So, It's time for an ad break. We'll be right back. And we are back. We're talking about the geography of tea. Geography is tea, rather. And we had just covered a lot of history in a very small period of time. (laughs) But there's one other thing. We're going to get to some more of the recent history as well. But there's one thing that we kind of have to talk about, just because Hunter and I are here based in the United States. And there's one event in particular that... I would say maybe it's a little bit mythologized as well, maybe a little bit aggrandized, but focuses around tea. Hunter, what is that event? It's got to be the Boston Tea Party, right? It's the Boston Tea Party. The it's it's almost an event that is again, I think it gets aggrandized a little bit, but has been heralded as like the the single event that sort of kicks off all of the sort of revolutionary war and independence movements and sort of coalesces a lot of things around. And so there's probably a little bit of truth into, into all of this. There's probably a lot more uh, mythologizing. We're going to run through just a little bit about that history because it just, it, it brings in tea, right? We got to talk about it. <laughs> it's a good tie. And we got to, we got to explore, you know, whether it's 
uh, exactly the way we might have learned about it when we were in elementary school or not, it's worth reviewing, I think. Absolutely. So uh, we're not going to go into a lot of some of the small minutia details of how things sort of bubbled up. But the first big thing you should know is that the British Parliament passed the Tea Act of 1773, which was designed to do a few things. One, it was designed to reduce the amount of overstocked tea that the British East India Company had in its warehouses. So the uh, the British East India Tea Company was based out of the uh, sort of the um, uh, the South Pacific area, and they had a lot of tea that was sort of sitting around, and they needed to, to get that out. And one of the reasons why it was sort of sitting around was because of this aspect of illegal tea, and which was tea that was being drunk within the British colonies, specifically in America at this time, or the United States at this time, the United States colonies at this time, I should say. Uh, that wasn't that wasn't coming through this British uh, tea company. In fact, it was coming from the Dutch. So this tea act was designed to undercut the price of illegal tea, thus forcing the colonists to pay taxes and duties on officially supplied tea. Uh, and so I have here in my notes, approximately 85% of all tea consumed in the North American colonies was smuggled in by the Dutch at this time. So wow. Again, you know, whether that number is exactly true, there's probably some wiggle room here and there. But regardless, I think it's probably safe to say that a majority of the tea drunk in North America at the time was not of British tea. Um, and so they introduced this Tea Act uh, of 1773, which was, you know, designed to basically make make the the the, the colonies more money or sorry, make the the British crown more money off the colonies. So as an act of defiance, according to the the history here. The Sons of Liberty, which was, you know, the pretty infamous or sorry, famous group of, of colonists who were vying for freedom from Britain during this time, organized an event wherein colonists, and there were specific uh, mentions here that some were dressed as indigenous Americans, which I thought was very interesting, um, boarded the, an East India Company ship and dumped all of the tea into the Boston Harbor. And this was a lot of tea and it was it was a lot of money at the time. I don't have the exact figure on my head, but it was it was. I think worthy worth uh, uh, millions about millions of dollars in today's money. Uh, the act uh, that had been passed, the Tea Act of 1773, uh, so that when that passed, it already sort of incensed a simmering divide between the colonies and Britain, um, which, where they sort of didn't feel like they should have to pay taxes um, uh, because they didn't have any sort of representation. Very famous saying here in the United States. So it's not just um, about tea, really. It's the tea becomes no. a symbol of, of taxation symbol. more broadly. Exactly. It was it's a it's just it was a coalescing point. It was a coalescing object, right? And so this led to after the the uh Boston Tea Party, it led to the something that the, we here in the United States know as the intolerable acts, which was a series of measures. Uh, passed in Britain, punitive measures designed to punish the colony of Massachusetts specifically um, for for the Boston Tea Party. Um, and this would be something that would be called the coercive acts in, in Great Britain, apparently. Um, and so this all sort of led to a maybe an inflection point where things were, you know, went, went from sort of simmering to hot. Um, the point here to make is that, you know, really the, the tea was an integral part of the development Um and maybe potentially the creation of the United States. And so in that, you know, I think there's debate on how impactful the the, the Boston Tea Party was, but just in that, you know, there's there's some, uh, uh, you know, momentous sort of history sitting behind this beverage that leads to the country we know today, which is obviously went on, goes on to have a huge impact on the world at, at, as a whole. Um, we can get into a lot of what ifs here, which we're not going to do because that's a it's an older period of time for for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it really is interesting, right? And and you know, it, Hunter, you had talked a little bit about sort of you know this maybe also being the time when people in North America, the, the colonies, or you know, United States after that sort of drift to coffee uh, as opposed to tea because tea is a, so associated with British, and there could be some some rationale behind that. Yeah, I think that there's you can find some some quotes from history that suggest that people are are drinking coffee because that's seen as um somehow patriotic or something like that. Right. Uh and whether the Tea Party, you know, whether it had a huge role or not in revolution, it's certainly kids woven into our popular understanding of history that this was a big event. So it's it's definitely worth talking about. And that tea figures really prominently. 
uh, mm-hmm. is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's move on. We're going to leave, leave the Boston Tea Party behind. Probably leave the United States behind mostly at this point. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit about it here and there. But let's move ahead in history. So uh, if we jump to the 1800s, this was during a time when China was essentially taken over by European colonizers. So there was this thing called the Opium Wars of, in 1842, uh, which was it's called the Opium Wars. But but the global demand for tea exceeded uh, Chinese production. So they really wanted to take over China for the aspect of getting production of the tea. Um, and so they they had these wars. They, they took over China, essentially. Uh, however, tea still wasn't meeting European demand. So to meet demand for tea, Europeans established tea plantations initially in Assam and Sri Lanka, Assam being a part of uh, modern-day India, <laughs> and then later in East Africa, Indonesia, and then now South America. And so tea drinking became so ingrained in the cultures of colonized indigenous peoples as to constitute one of Western imperialism's most visible post-colonial legacies, especially in India, right? So we have teas that we already went through, right? Assam and Darjeeling black teas. These are very popular teas. Um, and I think I have a fun quote here about um, about uh, Darjeeling tea, but Darjeeling tea is so culturally prominent in the West that where it's grown, the Darjeeling region of India, uh, they, they, they can't drink it. It's, it's not for them, right? It's, it's all for export. Point, it's all for export. It's just, it's too valuable for people who have, I guess, traditionally grown at least for a few hundred years are able, no longer able to consume it. Now, and granted, it was, smoke, you know, to tie into coffee for a second, I mm-hmm. spent some time in Guatemala, uh, in the 1990s and, you know, there's an enormous coffee industry in Guatemala, but almost all of that coffee is for export. And the coffee that I saw people drinking in Guatemala was was Nescafe, instant coffee, you know, mm-hmm. which is not something that's produced in Guatemala. So this is part of the global the globalized situation of the world today. Con- contemporary globalization is that people be involved in producing goods, farming things that that is almost a lot of times it's just for export and it's not for the domestic market at all. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's, that's a huge undercurrent for a lot of what we're seeing with tea as well. And so in 1858, so, you know, basically European colonies had already basically taken over China, although, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly complicated. Um, but in 1858, the British government took over direct control of India from the East India company, the, the same company that uh, was a, uh, uh, involved earlier during the Boston Tea Party, they take it. They the British government officially takes over India uh, because the British government wanted to grow the tea industry beyond just the Assam region, um, which is in India. And so this ended up being a huge success. Production was expanded, and by 1888, British tea imports from India were for the first time greater than those from China. If you recall, recall, recall correctly from our history, China has been a huge part of uh, tea history, dating back hundreds of years, centuries, millennia even, uh, in just a span of, you know, less than, you know, probably less than five decades, uh, India starts producing more for export to Britain specifically, but more than than coming from China. So that's sort of the analog with coffee in Brazil almost, right? Where exactly. It goes very from close. very little production to, to, to the highest production in the case of Brazil and coffee in the world since the mid 1800s exactly and and i i would say similar probably not exactly the same parallel in terms of of the way people were treated but if you you know if you look at the history of british colonization in india uh, it's very brutal people did not have a lot of freedoms um people were also subjugated in a lot of ways and forced into different pathways based on the caste system that was further upheld by the British um, during this time. So, uh, you know, I hesitate to use the word enslavement in a similar way because I think it's very different. And I think that that connotation gets looped in. But there was definitely a lot of servitude towards the British uh, colonizers that the Indians had to sort of navigate um, and were forced to navigate. So it's very brutal during this time. Just keep moving on because, uh, you know, I kind of want to get to, you know, past the history section here. But 
we we kind of want to talk a little bit about the tea bag and sort of how it came to be because it's again that's one of the most common aspects of tea today. So if you uh, purchase a, a a box of tea, they're all going to come in individually a little wrapped satchels of what we would call tea bags. And so this is kind of fun because while the United States is not a huge player in the tea market, we're going to find that out in a little bit. um, The tea bag, this quintessentially sort of iconic symbol of tea itself was actually uh, invented uh, in the United States by somebody by a U S merchant name of Thomas Sullivan in 1908. And so according to sort of, you know, history, Thomas started to send samples of tea to his customers in small silken bags. And I guess apparently some of his customers assumed that these silken bags were supposed to be used in the same way as a metal infuser. So they started dropping their tea. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, rather than so rather than emptying out its contents, right? Eventually, word got back to uh, Thomas that this is what people were doing. And so he started making his tea bags out of more of a gauze-like material. Gauze being something that has a little bit more uh, pass through of water rather than silk, uh, so this worked this worked out much better. And the t- the humble tea bag as we know it today entered full production in 1920. And the rest is sort of as we say history. I would say the one sort of uh, offshoot to that that we sort of are starting to see today is that tea bags are less frequently uh, made out of sort of a paper material, um, and today more being made out of plastic which is kind of interesting. If you go back to our plastics episode, you can learn a little bit more about the plastics industry, but obviously there are connotations for around the sustainability and the decomposition of that when that happens. So, so yeah, it's interesting that there's something that's disposable, something that seems a, a little bit more of an individual industrial scale comes out of the United States uh, and maybe not too surprising. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, it, it kind of tracks. Um, again, even though, Even at this point in time, you know, early 1900s, the U.S. was not a huge tea drinking society uh, culture, although, you know, obviously there is definitely a market here. But it's still funny to see that an invention like this does come out of the United States, which, again, maybe is not that surprising just knowing how sort of the industry and how industrious the, uh, the United States is at this time in particular. So speaking of industry... Let's talk a little bit about the tea industry. Um, that sort of wraps up our history history section. There's you know probably more to be said, but this isn't a tea podcast, and we only have a very limited right. amount of time. <laughs> it gives us a good overview of uh, several hundred or plus years of, of tea history. Thousands of years of history in 20 minutes. There you go. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> um, let's talk a little about the industry now. And so, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little about the, the size and scope of the tea industry. Hunter... Remind us what the coffee industry size was on the low end that you had. What was that figure that you had? All right. So on the low end for coffee, the industry uh, is in 2022 was $126 billion. And I have figures that are larger than that in terms of revenue, which are several times that. But at the low end, it's $126 billion. And so... The reason why I wanted you to remind our our listeners what that number was, because again, as as we're talking about these beverages, you know, we we often compare them. Um, but what we're going to find is that tea, the tea industry, as part of my research, is actually much smaller. And so, uh, here I have again, this is according to my notes, that the global industry of tea is worth about fourteen billion dollars per year. Uh, so that would be on the low end. That would probably be about one tenth the size of coffee. What I'm not able to track here is that if if this is all inclusive or if, or if this is just tracking a few of the more mainstream Western and European dominant uh, tea companies that maybe filter through the stock exchanges in the West. Right. So there could be other things at play here um, because while the, again, I have multiple sources that state this, including the National Geographic article, while Tea is a much smaller industry, according to monetary value. Apparently, tea is the most consumed beverage in the world behind only water. So there's some disparity here, right? So there well, there's some there's some ways to think about this that that might explain it. I mean, one is that, as you said, that these official statistics are tracking large companies and that mm-hmm. 
uh, on in smaller market situations where uh, there's not as much oversight that that accounts for some of what's going on. It also doesn't account for people who are are growing their own herbs, for example. They're growing their own plants, definitely, and and turning that into something at their homes or again on a small scale. Um, and then there's also the fact that coffee is just more expensive, and so that's, true. Uh, that's another way to that to, to maybe to rectify this idea that that the coffee is a bigger industry from a dollar standpoint, but that more tea is is consumed. Well, and and one of the things that I I was thinking about in our last last week's episode was, you know, in contrast to the tea industry, is that there really does seem to be in coffee a lot more middlemen type type companies and organizations, right? From where the, the bean is grown to all of these different sort of processes that it goes through. And it doesn't seem like tea has as many. So there doesn't seem to be a need for things to maybe get as expensive, maybe, you know, all but this there's not a roasting stuff. analog to tea. There's no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's got to be probably dried or cured in some way, but that's not maybe the same thing as, as roasting. Um, and and certainly we've been led to believe that roasting is is the a very big key to the flavor of coffee. And so that mm-hmm. that that's another difference, maybe. Right. And so with that, let's talk a little bit about some of the key sort of major players in the tea industry. So I have here uh my the the biggest company that sort of deals in tea would be a company called Tata Global Beverages. Uh, I think now uh, actually called Tata Consumer Products. I think they've since expanded. Um have you ever heard of this company before? I can't say that I have. Probably, yeah, I, I wouldn't expect you to. I wouldn't say that they're very prominent in the United States. There might be a brand or two. I can't remember from their website. But even then, I, there was nothing that was outwardly obvious to me that as being a U.S. product. The The product I think that would be most famous, at least inside the Western sort of uh, uh, European and uh, really European world, would be a tea called Tetley Tea. And so, that sounds more familiar to me. It sounds, yeah, it sounds familiar. Um, I have absolutely had Tetley tea when I was in the UK, for example. Um, I haven't seen it in the stores, you know, here in Portland. Um, but apparently Tata tea is their big one that would be in India. And so they make up, you know, by far the largest company um, in terms of tea sales. That would be followed up by uh, a company that we're, we're probably all well aware of, um, although maybe not to the extent that you might think, but a a company called Unilever. And if you know anything about Unilever, Hunter, actually tell us a little about Unilever. I know that they're a massive food industry, uh, that they're located in the Netherlands, I believe. Um, And that one of the reasons you might not be as familiar with them is because their name doesn't show up on a lot of their brands. Exactly. So for example, one of the brands they acquired a number of years ago is Ben and Jerry's ice cream, but I don't think that you'll see the word Unilever on a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream anymore. Exactly, they are. They're kind of just like a a food and beverage conglomerate, and they exist mostly through their brands, right? Um, and so Whereas that's Uni- a little bit different from Nestle because Nestle has lots of different brands, but Nestle true. has the name recognition that I think Unilever does not. Absolutely true. Yeah, and so. Uh, in terms of the tea world, uh, uh, Unilever, through its one of its subsidiaries called Ekaterra, I could be mispronouncing that, they own the formerly American company Lipton, Lipton Tea, which is still a very prominent uh, and the largest tea brand in the United States with nearly $220 million in annual sales as of 2020. Um, so again, that's, that's, that's a huge amount of money, um, maybe not quite as much as coffee, but still quite a lot of money for or Unilever. Um, not my favorite tea, if I can be sort of brunt and honest. Um, to me, it's it's sort of sort of the Folgers of of the tea world. <laughs> um, that would be followed up by another tea company called Bigelow Tea Company. Now, this is an American company. It's privately held, so we don't actually have uh, uh, hard figures, although we can estimate. Um, and I thought this was fun for you, Hunter. Uh, Bigelow Tea is from your home state of Connecticut. Um, oh, shout out to all my peeps uh, in Connecticut. Always like to go. emphasize the Connecticut angle if I ever can. So absolutely, I'm there you go. That up. <laughs> um, so, anyways, they have apparently they have a, a, a quite a large tea company based out of Connecticut. Um, I have here. This is from my notes, so it's 
Again, it's the second largest tea brand in the U.S. with about $190 million in annual sales. They are a privately held company, though, so we don't actually have a good look into it. These are all estimates from. Okay. Um, whereas, you know, with Unilever, there are there are reports that we can find and we can dig. That's right. Um, this would be followed by a, a tea company called Associated British Foods. And this would be the brand that, of tea that you drink, um, uh, Hunter Twinnings. So Twinnings right. Tea. Although maybe now you'll switch to Bigelow. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, maybe I'll have to try. I think it's just, you know, it's one of those things with certain brands where if you start at a certain age, you know, buying a certain brand, sometimes that just carries forward, which is why there's so much competition totally. for young people to buy products because there is a lot of brand loyalty just based out of habit. Totally. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a lot of, yeah. A lot of associations, something doesn't taste quite right to you if you have another sort of Earl Grey, for example. There are a lot more tea uh, companies that sort of deal in this trade. I'll, I'll just list a few of them off here. We're not going to go into the details, but there's um, there's a big tea company called Tay Tea. There's, of course, our friends over at Nestle. They have a big tea uh, division. Um, there's the Mighty Leaf Tea Company. There's Numi, Numi Organic Tea. There's the Republic of Tea. Uh, there's a company called Tazo Tea Company, which was uh, uh, founded in here in Portland, Oregon. So shout out to Portland. There is uh, Tivana, which was founded in Atlanta. Both of these companies were at one point purchased and owned by Starbucks, although Ta Tazo is no longer owned by Starbucks. Uh, it's now owned by uh, uh, Unilever. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it always filters up to Unilever, it seems. Um and then just going down, you know, there's some other names here, you know, Tim Hortons, um, you know, obviously they're a big coffee brand in Canada. They now have a big tea group. And then there's a company called Stash Tea, which obviously I have to give a call out because it's based here in Portland. It's my favorite tea company. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about sort of the establishment of Tazo. Uh, maybe at the end of this episode could also maybe be a bonus episode. So depending Ooh. on how long this one goes. <laughs> okay. Um, just in terms of where the tea production and trade is coming from, Asia Pacific uh, dominated the tea market with about a share of 36.2% in 2019. And so this is largely attributed to the high consumption of tea on a daily basis as an affordable, keyword there, beverage mm -hmm. suitable for consumers from all socioeconomic groups and countries such as China and India. And so maybe that is sort of the story around why coffee is so much more prevalent and more uh, the, the industry size, so much more prevalent, so much more dominant. Uh, maybe it's just Tea is just much more more affordable in these countries. And I think with that, we're going to do a very quick ad break because I feel oh, like time I'm for a break. Time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so and then we'll come that. back and we'll get into some of the uh the some of the real contemporary stuff dealing with. Yeah, real contemporary. We're gonna do some some heavy geography. Ooh. <laughs> All right, here we go. And we are back. We're talking about geography as tea on the Geography is Everything podcast. We have run through a lot of history. We ran through some of the industry, some of the major players, sort of some of the money involved here. Uh, and while geography is always sprinkled in throughout all of these episodes in a lot of different meaningful ways, uh, of course, we always want to get to the point where we actually talk about more of the the direct geography, sort of the modern day geography, where, where are things existing, where are things playing out? And so, Hunter, I'm going to ask you, and of course you have your notes here, but I don't think you would guess any other answer either way, especially knowing the history already. Where where is tea consumed the most today? I I, I guess China. Uh, it, yeah, it's absolutely China by far uh, in terms of the amount of tea drunk. Um, that should be surprising to nobody. There's 1.4 billion people there. Such a huge cultural legacy within China, uh, and it's still very prominently featured today. This but even per, but even per capita, not just overall amounts, right? But even per capita, is, no. Or is that not? Oh, oh, That's so the, not true. the story changes. Okay. The story changes here. So now I'm going to throw it back to you and say on a per capita basis, uh, who do you think is the, the top, top country? I mean, the countries I would guess would be China, Japan, India, United Kingdom. Those are the, those are the countries that would come to my mind based on what I thought before and based on what we've been talking about. Only one of those made the top 10. Wow. Yeah. So only the United Kingdom make, makes the top 10. Okay. And the United Kingdom is not the top country. Okay. The top country uh, is Turkey. Um, and people, the Tur Turkish people, apparently they drink around uh, 6.96 pounds of, of tea on an annual basis. 
Um, huh. If you ever have you if you ever felt a tea bag in your hand, you can. You, it's pretty light, <laughs> right? <laughs> not not a lot of heft there, so um, that's quite a lot. Um, this is followed up by Ireland with uh, four point eight three pounds, and then the United Kingdom at four point two eight pounds, and then it sort of starts to drift back towards um, Asia a little bit, um, though not quite as far east as China. So then we get to Pakistan, followed by Iran, and then it goes you know to Russia, Morocco. New Zealand, Chile, the only Western Hemisphere uh, country on our top 10. Interesting. And then Egypt. And so this is really kind of a scattershot of geography, right? There doesn't seem to be any sort of direct link to what we would assume as being the top uh, consumers of tea. Right. This is how it differs from coffee because on a per capita basis, it's in the top 25, there were 21 of them were European countries and, and most of the top ones were Northern European countries. Exactly. That, I mean, that all seemed to, to track very well. Geographically, coffee being so heavily dominant in Europe with Canada being the, the lone country out, that the, the, the logic there seemed to track a little bit more than the logic that I'm seeing here um, for tea. Now, obviously, we can look at the United Kingdom and Ireland, which, you know, at one point... Ireland was subjugated by the UK. So I think that makes a little bit of sense. We can see here that, you know, those two were, or at least the United Kingdom was a huge colonizer. They grafted onto tea pretty early on. It sort of became one of their signature beverages that sort of established them as who they are. So this all makes sense. Yeah. It's what's different about this list also than the coffee list of the top per capita consumption is that it cuts across countries of different levels of relative affluence as well. It, exactly where I was going. And then then you have the difference in the amount of money that people have, right? So you have the likes of Egypt, for example, up there with the likes of the United Kingdom, right? And those, those two countries have a wildly different uh, uh, sort of purchasing power between their, two, their respective people. Um, if we go back to China just a, a little bit, just because we got to talk about them, they right. come in at 21st on a per capita basis. Okay. So the average Chinese person uh, apparently drinks about one and a quarter pounds of tea per year. Do we know where the United States comes in on this list? We do. Of course. Of course, I'm going to find that information okay. and bring it all to it. They were higher than I would have expected. Okay. Or I guess we were higher. Uh, so the United States comes in at 30, uh, 35th, uh, which with uh, about, point, about half a pound per person consumed on average okay. per year. So. Um, what I couldn't find is the, and, and it, it probably exists out there. I probably just wasn't digging deep enough or I wasn't going down the right rabbit holes. What I couldn't find was um, what the most popular types of tea were within respective countries. Okay. So yeah, I that's harder to research. For my part, I really was interested in, okay, for the United States, you know, what kind of teas are most popular? Um, I think in my head, I would associate the United States tea drinkers as probably being more on the herbal tea side. Um, just again, anecdotal evidence from, from here. Um, but it's kind of interesting, right? It's, 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 it's a pretty interesting spread of where, where countries are falling on the, the tea drinking scale. And again, had I been able to get at, at to the information of, you know, whether it was black teas or green teas leading a region, I think that would have uh, maybe given us a few more answers. I just wasn't able to get there. Um, now that said, if we go to sort of where it's tea grown, okay. um, where would you think the biggest top producing tea country is? I would go back to China again, and that would be my first. Guess. And that is correct. Okay. <laughs> so China, China does overall drink the most tea, as you know, not on a per capita basis, just overall. They also grow the most, so they apparently they grow about two million tons annually. Um, and then, like we said in sort of our history section, in in China, each region sort of has its own specific expertise in tea, own different recipes. Um, and generally, uh, in China, green tea makes up nearly 75% of the production. Wow. The remaining okay. 20% is dedicated to black and dark teas, and then 5% to oolong teas. So, again, we don't have this information, but you would assume that in China, probably uh, people are generally drinking green tea more often than black tea. Mm -hmm. Whereas I do know that inside the uh, Western Europe and, and places such as the United States is mostly black teas. Uh, that's followed up by India. Um, so they grow uh, about 1.2 2 million tons of tea annually. And this would largely be dominated in the uh, province of Assam. Uh, 
um, which is situated in sort of the northeast uh, uh, region of India. Hunter, I think inside our coffee episode, we learned that coffee was prominently grown in, primarily grown in the south, southern region of of India. That's correct. Do I remember that? Yeah. That's right. Um, so, so tea is pro- predominantly seems to be grown in the northern region. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's also the Darjeeling uh, region, which is uh, uh, in the east, uh, sort of in between Bangladesh, Myanmar, China, uh, still what we would consider to be northern India in terms of geographic uh, space. Um, uh, anyways, the, um, and this is sort of our, I have a note here. It says the origin of Darjeeling tea, which is a very, very, um, high quality tea. That's very, uh, highly sought after inside the Western markets. Um, so because of its high price, Darjeeling tea is exclusively reserved for export or at least predominantly not every bag, obviously. I'm sure there's some tea, Darjeeling tea drunk in, in India, but generally, um, it's it's reserved to go to the United States, to go to uh, the UK, go to Western Europe. Um, that would be followed up by Kenya um, as the third largest grower of tea. So there's 432,000 uh, tons of tea grown annually. And Kenya is the world's largest exporter of black tea. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I know there's a coffee from, industry there too, although I don't know how big it is compared to this, these things. But it's interesting to learn no. that it's the largest exporter of black tea. Yeah. And so if, if we go back to India, so Assam and Darjeeling, these are both black teas um, and they're very prominent, but they're still not the most grown. And so um, so Kenya actually grows the most amount of black tea. So if you're drinking generally any kind of black tea, there's a good chance that what you're drinking is coming from from Kenya, not, not exclusively, but generally. And then, of course, then there's Sri Lanka, um, which also feature very prominently in our coffee episode. Um, so they grow about 340,000 tons of tea annually. Um, and tea culture there has become so prominent that, uh, one of the nicknames for Sri Lanka is the tea Island. So together, these four countries represent about 75% of global tea production. Wow. Okay. So it's really highly concentrated. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And of the 75%, um, the majority, the vast majority of that is really within the, the Asian uh, areas of India, Sri Lanka, and China. So Africa, or sorry, Kenya being the one, the lone African holdout of them. And so let's go ahead and do a little bit, maybe some some climate change uh, uh, discussion on tea, and maybe we'll okay. just wrap it up there. Um, we'll get to our, we'll have a, bo- we're definitely gonna have a bonus episode. So if you want to learn nice. more about that, I'll leave you a little That's teaser right. at the end. Oh, good, good. <laughs> so this is coming from, um, I, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole in the climate change, uh, impact of climate change on tea production and trade, just because it's such a prominent topic. Um, so I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole. I found a, an article out of the Nature Journal um, from uh, Anna. I'm very sorry, Anna. I'm going to have trouble pronouncing your last name, but Anna Nova Grotsky. Um, that'd be how I might pronounce your name. Um, she wrote an article on uh, titled "How Climate Change Might Affect Tea," and so she gave a, a number of examples um, about sort of where tea is being grown and sort of how the climate is changing to impact that. And so one of the um, things that she 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 wrote about is the Assam region in India. And so she said, she wrote, writes here that climate change is pushing rainfall in Assam to the extremes, um, which leads to an overall decrease in precipitation. Um, I, know I actually, sorry, I think I have a mistype here. I think it's overall increase in precipitation, but with more instances of drought and then periods of heavy rain. And so that's so less a, consistent regime, less consistent. Right. And, and one thing I sort of found from my research, even though this isn't really an agricultural podcast, so I didn't want to dive into it too deeply, but it's that tea and growing tea can often be pretty um, finicky, right? So it's it's not an easy, uh, um, not an easy sort of plant to grow. And so uh, she then dovetails into Yunnan province in China, where uh, more rain during monsoon season has been showing to lead to a decrease in tea. Right, so too much water is now having an impact there. Um, most of China's tea-producing regions, as it turns out, is uh, are found in the south, where overall rainfall is increasing, and the instances of heavy rain uh, is damaging tea crops, um, and that's becoming a much more frequent uh, outcome. Um, 
And of course, you know, temperatures are climbing in both India and China, and this is where the vast majority of tea has grown. And so in Assam, plantation managers are saying that increasingly frequent hot spells are har harming their yields. Uh, heat waves are also uh, very dangerous for plantation workers, right? So again, you know, not to conflate the the aspect of slavery in, in, in Brazil and in Central America and with the coffee with with the issues here, but there are definitely labor issues that get factored into the tea industry as well. And just like with coffee, uh, tea, tea production plantations are very human labor intensive. And so these heat waves, especially in places like India, which I do believe just uh, had a very extreme heat wave in the north, um, you know, these, this becomes a dangerous situation for, for the people living there and working in these plantations. Um, and then so in just in general, exposure of tea plants to sunlight uh, can damage crops. Um, so, right, so there's too much sunlight. Uh, and so this is increasing in both uh, China and India. Um, you know, there's there's some uh, uh, areas where they're trying to mitigate this. And one of that is through uh, something we would call ag agroforestry. And I think we might have talked about this on an episode way back when, Hunter. Um, awesome. Basically, yeah, basically where they're trying to plant uh, uh, tea um, with really more of a natural environment, such as like a forest, which provides more shade to protect, protect them, um, you know, cre and keeps moisture in. Um, really, it's seen, I think, as a more economically or sorry, environmentally viable method of agriculture where your so things are sort of getting step away mixed from, from monocropping, although it still sounds sort of like monocropping, at least there's uh, more of a permaculture type of situation there where we're using other plants exactly. to, to, to achieve benefits for the plant that you want. Yeah, exactly. And so this article, uh, Anna's article was focused primarily on India and China tea production. Um, I would say it's probably safe to assume that Sri Lanka and Kenya are having similar uh, issues, uh, detrimental issues. I can't imagine that they're not. I, I just don't have those facts and figures in front of me. Um, but I think the, the the takeaway here is that while tea has historically been a fairly cheap drink to consume, that actually might change uh, pretty soon here as, as climate change sort of upends a lot of the historic growing regions for tea. And so... You know, going back to our list of countries that drink the most on a per capita basis, you know, even a country like Turkey, which is relatively wealthy, but not as wealthy as the United Kingdom, uh, would they still be able to afford, would people there still be able to afford their their tea in the future? And you I know, another know. thing, another thing that underlies the ability to produce and and distribute this much tea and coffee throughout the world, something we didn't talk about last episode, is is oil. Right. The 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 fact that there's a lot of oil available and a lot of it's subsidized mm -hmm. uh, means that this global trade and things like coffee and tea is viable in a way that if oil starts to cost more and more, that's going to increase the cost of these commodities or these these beverages as well. No, that's a that's a huge point to make. Right. The logistics of. Really everything. Right. But, you know, we're going to talk we're talking about coffee and, and last week and tea this week, you know, very much, you know, sort of at the whims of that industry and sort of how expensive it is to get goods from one place to the next until there's another viable fuel, which, you know, there's not really right now, that's going to continue to be the case. Um, and so we'll see, we'll see what happens in the tea industry. I'm sure just like with coffee, coffee's probably also having its uh, own issues with climate change, but I think we're going to leave it at that for now. Um, so there's a whole other part of this episode that I wrote that's now going to be a bonus episode because we're just out of time for today. Um, and that is on a man named Stephen Smith. Um, and if you're a tea aficionado like me, you might know him. Um, he is a Portland local person and he founded not one, not two, but three pretty prominent tea companies um, that I've already mentioned, uh, at least two of them in this episode. So come back on Friday to hear more about Stephen Smith. To get the bonus material. To get the bonus material. Hunter, you want to run through some pluggables? Thanks, Jeff. I'm Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I am co-author of two books with David Vanis, Portland is a Cultural Atlas and Upper Left Cities, a Cultural Atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, and co-host with my friend Jeff Gibson of this podcast. Yeah, thanks, Hunter. My name is Jeff Gibson. You can find me uh, 
In addition to being the co-host of this podcast, Geography is Everything, you can find me on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash little at sign geography by Jeff, where I create much smaller, shorter, more concise geography videos that just sort of cover a single topic here and there. Uh, they're entertaining. Um, you can also find Hunter and myself over on our Substack. That's geographyiseverything.substack.com, where we're growing a fun little geography community there. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about geography that we're, we're talking about, in, in addition to being able to listen to this podcast, uh, you can do so there. Um, and that's where ultimately uh, the these little mini bonus episodes will live exclusively. So the first few are going everywhere, but eventually we're going to we're going to put those into Substack exclusively. So with that, uh, we will see you next time when we are going to explore the wonderfully weird geography of Wrexham AFC. Wow. That's going to be, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a nerdy one, but it's, it's such a microcosm of geography, which couldn't, I just couldn't help myself. So I'm not sure that there are too many of our episodes that <laughs> can't carry the label nerdy. I mean, I think that that's our hallmark here, right? That's that exactly. <laughs> just embracing that. All right. We will see you all or we'll, you'll hear us uh, next week or maybe on Friday. If you tune in for the bonus episode, have a good one. Thanks for listening. <laughs>